This is Glambition Radio, episode number 218, with Carolyn Rods, co founder and CEO of Hello Alice. Welcome to Glambition Radio. I am your host, Allie Brown. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor, investor, and mom of twins. I love thinking big, doing different, and exploring ideas that disrupt the status quo, especially when it comes to women, because we are rewriting the rules for leadership, business success, making money, and changing the world. And we're doing it with style. Let's go. I have a question for you. What do the United Nations Foundation, a New York City Mafia Steakhouse, and women's entrepreneurship have in common? My relationship with Carolyn Rods. Carolyn and I met several years ago, I think it was 2016, at the United Nations Foundation's Global Entrepreneur Accelerator event. And it was actually like at the UN building in New York. It was an incredible experience. I was honored to be a part of it. And I think she was sitting behind me and we know you just start chatting with other gals around. It's a long day at these things, incredible event, but some of these things, you know, you don't get to eat much. I'm used to like wandering around snacking all day. And it's, it was very controlled. As you can imagine, it's a high security building and you can't just go wandering around looking for a restroom or, you know, it's, it's very controlled. So let me just say, especially at that time, I wasn't able to eat as much as, as I was would like. I was a little podgier then too. So I grabbed Carolyn at the end of this thing. I'm like, you want to get out of here? Let's get dinner. She's like, yes, awesome. So we had to walk the five miles out of the event to the specific like Uber pickup. We get an Uber and we just get in. We hadn't even had time to research restaurants. We're just exhausted. And we say to the guy, because he's local, take us to like a really good steakhouse. Just take us to somewhere local. We don't want to go too far. And he said, uh, he's like this older guy. He's like, I I know the best steaks in New York. You will love this place. We're like, okay, great. And and Carol and I are chatting and I don't even ask where he's taking us. And so I think it was about 15 blocks away. If I remember it was the upper East side somewhere. And he drops us off at this place and I don't even really look at the name of it. We just go in and we're so tired. We just grab a booth and sit down and look at the menu and we get drinks, start ordering. And then we're kind of looking around and we're like, this is absolute mafia steakhouse. Like, I don't know where we are right now. The place was called Sparks. And sure enough, later we did an internet search and there was an absolute mob hit outside this restaurant in the 80s. Like it's known for that. We're like guaranteed bodies in the basement of this place. Great steak though, great dinner, interesting people watching. And so we will forever have a laugh about that. Now, let me tell you more about Carolyn. So her background was at JP Morgan. She went into banking and then realized, wow, this just isn't for me. I really want to do something different. I want to work for myself. And she went through many renditions of business and figuring out what she was good at. There were highs, there were lows. I don't want to spoil a story, but it was so refreshing to hear someone speak so candidly about a business going completely backwards to how she had admitted it and knowing why, looking back and knowing now exactly what she would have done differently. It was like the best education that I was going to say money can't buy, but she also kind of bought it. she lost a lot of money, right? So there's an investment involved. But that led to the next thing, led to the next thing, led to what she's doing now. She is co-founder and CEO of Hello Alice. It's a free multi-channel platform powered by AI technology. And I have to tell you that when COVID came out, there was so much misinformation everywhere about these PPP loans and the disaster funding. I mean, the whole thing was a mess if you were keeping up with it. Even if you're not a business owner, you heard about what a mess this was. And they came out with, at helloalice.com, by far the best COVID-19 resource site I had seen. Very succinct, accurate information. They kept it updated. Links worked. You know, it was a dream. It was like, why couldn't someone else do this? Well, you know, they did it and it's still up. She'll mention where to go, but you should go sign up for helloalice.com anyway. It has incredible resources, really great discussion groups, services, access to funding, 
really great resources that all of you could use. I mean, and not just women too, and they're not limited to women, but kind of, you know, from the beginning, I know her focus and mission has been for women. They've opened it broader now. Two quick things before we get started. The first is a shout out and a big thank you to two reviews my team pulled for me from Apple Podcasts. Allie, your podcast has inspired me at a time when it was very much needed, smart and insightful and just different with no apologies. Listening to you and your remarkable guests is my go-to car ride podcast. Thank you. That was from Loralee L. from the US. And the next is CC Yoli 65 from Netherlands. Most inspirational business show without blah, blah. I'm going to use that in my marketing. I love that. Thank you. I think I've been listening to Allie's show for five years already. I'm from the Netherlands. I just love hearing big stories and female leaders inspiring my entrepreneurial side to dream and do big. You should absolutely listen to this show. And a quick reminder that our show today is sponsored by The Trust. It's the new private premier network for seven and eight figure women entrepreneurs. If you or another female leader you know is craving more powerful connections, more elevated conversation, and a modern platform for connecting with other high performing women globally, Visit jointhetrust.org for more details and to request a brief informational interview. Now get ready for a fascinating conversation with Carolyn Rods. Carolyn, where are you right now? I am in Healdsburg, California, where I'm spending the summer with my phenomenal business partner, Elizabeth Gore. And we're tackling the next phase of Hello Alice. Now, are you also indulging in the products of her family vineyard? I am. I'm (laughs) definitely enjoying wine country, although masked and keeping our social distancing. But we're enjoying the beautiful weather. We've got all of our kids together. We actually keep laughing because it's just like when we started Hello Alice. I lived with Elizabeth actually in her guest house for four months while we commuted in and out of San Francisco and built the first stage of Hello Alice. And my kids at that time were, we actually celebrated their third and fifth birthday right before our launch. And now it's so crazy to see the four kids back together. And now we've got the husbands in tow. And we're I back was joking to in the pre-chat that we should start just a homeschool co-op and we'll bring the kids up too. And we can all get some work done finally. I'm telling you, we have a we call it Camp Pino it, with a, a little ode to the wine, but they are hard at work and frankly want nothing to do with us this summer, which is after being cooped up in our house for, for so yeah. long during shelter in place. It's, it's nature, awesome seeing them. Oh my gosh. Nature and run out the, run through fields and stuff. It just sounds heavenly. Sounds great. Be careful. Yes. I may find out where she lives and just show come, up. Come visit us. Come, I'll send you yeah. the address. We'll, we'll load up their Land Rover and come on up. <laughs> you get an open invite, Allie. We'd love to have <laughs> All you. All right. That's good to know. It's great to reconnect. You know, you and I don't get to chat much. I'm always watching what you're doing. I had the honor of meeting you, you know, a few years ago and, uh, God, we met at some fantastic events. It was the United Nations Foundation Global Accelerator, right, for entrepreneurs. That was an amazing event. Then Dwen and Dell, when they were doing those fantastic events for women. And you were in a kind of a different space then. Now, your career's gone through some elevations. Would you mind kind of walking through, you know, how you got started as an entrepreneur? Well, I appreciate that you called them elevations <laughs> because the road hasn't always elevated all along the way. Yeah, I took a really winding route to Hello Alice. But I think, frankly, it was a lot of those mostly downs, I have to say, that really built the foundation of of the company we've created today. I started my first company in the retail space, built that company for two years, and then ultimately ran out of cash, ran out of energy, and and closed that company down. I have actually done a TED Talk on it. It was luxury home goods. So everything from stationery to candles to gift wrap to all sorts of things for just home and gift. And it sold at places like Neiman Marcus and Harrods, and Bloomingdale's. But ultimately, I, I didn't have enough in terms of the... I, I needed to spend a lot more on inventory. I wasn't moving products off the shelves fast enough. And just ran out of cash to build it. It sounds like such a glamorous business and you forget how much work that takes and how much cash, like you're saying, like, because you got to move product. It's just a whole different world. Let me tell you, there was nothing glamorous about that business. Although my friends were like, you're so lucky. It's so cool. I saw your products at Neiman's. And meanwhile, I was, you know, using my spare bedroom in my 
townhouse that I could barely pay for at the time to package up boxes myself. I didn't even have enough money to call the UPS driver to come to my house. I would pack them in my car to deliver them to the UPS store because it was cheaper. Like every penny counted at that time. Mm-hmm. There was nothing glamorous about it. Oh, so you just, you just shut it down, just kind of walked away, just said, that's it? Yeah, I, I actually did a TEDx talk on failure. It was, I would say, the lowest point of my career to date. I had left a career in investment banking where I was before. I was watching all of my friends get promoted and, and make great salaries. And meanwhile, I was broke. I had racked up credit card debt. I couldn't pay my mortgage. I had to sell my house eventually just to get my feet back on the ground. It was a really tough time and, and frankly, just broke down all of my confidence. And I really struggled for a bit to understand why, because it was the first thing in my life I had poured all of my energy into and tried extraordinarily hard and failed. So there was a, a big moment of just, I, I kind of took a step back from that, got a job making a third of what I was making when I left my job in investment banking and took some time to reflect and just get my feedback on the ground. Um, this is so sad. I hope this turns around. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, you yes, a it. dark place. <laughs> what, what, what. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> Luckily, that's not where the story ends. Where's being I, your I, wounds and reminiscing of your golden days. And yeah. So, yeah, so I was at that moment. out of that, obviously. Yeah, you know, I went through, I think, all of the stages of grief that come with closing a business down. And I was embarrassed. I didn't want to tell, you know, I was embarrassed to tell my friends. I was embarrassed to tell my family. It was, it was tough. But I also wasn't going to let my story end there. And so I got this job making not very much money, but enough to at least pay my bills and help me scrape through and, and put my head on straight. And I decided, I kept seeing all these business owners running these companies And I was like, there's no reason I can't do this. I know in my heart of hearts, I can build a business. And so I looked, I really studied everything that I did wrong. I studied what these business owners were doing that I didn't do. I watched the way they worked. I watched the way they networked. I really started to understand the assets that I had at my disposal that I hadn't used for that first business. And that included an incredible network I'd built through investment banking, through my college days, I actually did have a a strong network and it wasn't a strong network in the sense of, you know, someone was going to write me a check tomorrow to invest in my company, but it was a strong network in that I could build those relationships up. You know, I had been in meetings with CEOs of major companies. They didn't know me or care about who I was, but Mm -hmm. I had their email address. Mm -hmm. And so I started leveraging that network to open doors and build a company in the digital media space. And little by little, I chipped away at getting one client, then I had two clients. It was very much a consulting model. It required no capital to build, which was great. Mm -hmm. And I brought in a business partner because I'd read a stat that companies with business partners are more likely to succeed. I mean, I was very studied about the process and thoughtful about how I was going to build the second business because I knew if I failed at this one, I was done. And so there was no way I was going to fail at this one. So you did a lot much more research and planning. Oh my gosh. I mean, my first business, I was 25. I jumped into it. I never, I never really failed at something that I tried very hard at. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd failed at things. I hadn't gotten accepted into something that I'd applied for, little things, but it wasn't anything that I had put every you know, ounce of like faith and energy and effort into until then. And I'd always gotten good grades in school. I'd gotten into the college of choice. I had graduated with honors. Like I had done everything I was supposed to do and the outcome reflected that. Mm -hmm. And this time I felt like I'd done everything I was supposed to do and the outcome didn't reflect the effort I'd put forth. So with the second company, I leveraged every relationship I had. I pulled every lever. I wasn't waiting for that moment to be ready. I was like, I'm going to do it today on day one. I'm going to pull every string I can to try to make this company work. And it, it showed. I mean, I started one client grew to another. I started asking clients for referrals. Those referrals grew. I always said yes to everything that would figure out how to make it work on the back end. And that company grew organically over the course of about seven years. And then ultimately, I sold that to a client. And it wasn't a game-changing amount of capital, but it was enough to A, give me the confidence that I could build a business and B, give me some time to think about the next stage. Yeah. I think when I met you, you were on the tail end of that or just completed that. 
Yes. Yeah. That was right about the time that I was kicking off the next, the next leg of the journey. Yeah. Cause I remember a, a conversation about transition or something like around those things. We were a few drinks in mind you. Yes. Um, I do remember that at some point in New York at the end of the day. <laughs> I think when we met, yes, I, I, fondly remember that dinner at Sparks Steakhouse in New York <laughs> where, yeah, just really, I don't even know if I knew what I was doing at that point. I think I really was just, but I learned it was, that was an event. I think that was at that UN Global Accelerator. And then shortly thereafter or before, I can't remember the order of events, but at, at Dell's Women's Entrepreneur Network event, those were networks to me that opened up so much. And Ali, I remember sitting next to you at a table at Dwen. And listening to you and Kara Golden from Hintwater talk about the companies that you had built. And it really inspired me just to think bigger. I think meeting women like you at networking events like that, it broadens sort of your mindset in terms of what can happen and what could be. And I think it's so important to always be building those networks. It's why what you're doing at, at the Trust is so important. Because and I miss it live. I miss it live. Don't you? I mean... Oh, I, I, you don't miss the travel, I know, but... I don't miss the travel. I think what you miss from the online space is those chance connections, right? You and I would have never collided mm -hmm. in a virtual conference. Uh, we collided because we happened to sit next to each other and happened to start a conversation in a room full of hundreds of other women, but something brought us together. And so I, I think that's the piece that there is no replacement for that for the random connections. Yeah. We're doing our best though online this year. We're all adapting. So so when did the idea for Hello Alice start? Cuz that also that was also the event in New York where I met Elizabeth. Yes. Elizabeth at that time was the entrepreneur. Well, I think she was still at the UN Foundation yeah. actually. Right after I sold that company, I started getting invited to events like that. I felt like doors opened up to me. I started getting invited to speak at events. People would reach out. I, my network grew exponentially after I sold the business. And frankly, it pissed me off because every time I'd make a connection or every time I'd be in a room like that, I'm like, this is what I needed. If I had had this at day one on that first company, my trajectory would have been so different. I would have built my career so much faster. I would have built those businesses differently it would have been a much easier journey. I felt fortunate, frankly, that I had the luxury of getting to start over again and getting to try my hand at running a business twice. A lot of people don't have that luxury. They don't get their feet back on the ground and they aren't able to pick things up and they end up on a path that's really difficult. And so for people who get one hand at that opportunity, I wanted to make sure that they could open those doors up on day one. And not open every door, but I think open the doors that are relevant and make sense for them at the point in time they're at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is really the goal with, with Hello Alice is how could we leverage technology to make smart connections to networks, to opportunities, to capital, all of the tools and resources that every entrepreneur needs at a moment in time. How could we do that in a smart way by using machine learning, by understanding who that business owner is and the type of company they want to grow? Imagine what that could do in terms of building a more equitable and efficient and effective small business ecosystem. And there really wasn't anything else out there like that. I was trying to, you know, kind of, I was watching what you're doing, figuring it out, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting because there wasn't something specifically for business owners and people growing a business. And there's a lot of disparate information out there. There's a lot of stuff, but sorting through it can be maddening. So you were looking also to simplify this for people. Yeah, I would ask people all the time, where do you go for information? How did you learn how to do this? Like, where did you turn to? And constantly the answer was, I, I go to my network. I go to you know, the people that I know. I ask people who've been through it before. I went to this accelerator, I went to this program, I went to this community organization, and none of it was scalable. And so, so I decided at that point, how do we take this model and scale it? And the very first iteration was a virtual accelerator called Circular Board. And the idea of that was, how do we take a traditional technology accelerator program which at that time really only existed in San Francisco and New York and a handful of other cities. And how do we create it in a way that works 
for women. And I looked specifically at that point at my situation. I was, you know, I just had my first child. I had a spouse who was tied to a job in Houston. I couldn't pack up and move to Silicon Valley or to New York for three months to participate in a startup program. And so I decided to create a virtual experience and studied those models, recreated it in a virtual environment. Mm -hmm. And through that process learned, every business owner is asking the same questions. How do I get the best talent for my company? How do I get the capital to build my company? How do I create my brand online? How do I hire my first employee? All of these questions that were really common things that we've all dealt with in our businesses But we were answering them and I was listening to the mentors that we brought in. They were answering them in different ways based on the company and the person they were responding to. And so what made sense for somebody with a tech company in New York City probably didn't make sense for somebody with a manufacturing company in Atlanta. Or what made sense or a program that they would recommend for an African-American entrepreneur or a veteran entrepreneur didn't necessarily make sense for somebody who lived overseas. And so there were just all of these different pieces that were kind of playing into the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I started to sort of see this formula almost around it. And I was like, okay, if we could aggregate all of these resources, if we could tag them by who they're relevant to and at what point they're relevant to them, I think we could change the way that people run their businesses. And I think if we can change the way people run their businesses, we can build a more diverse small business ecosystem We can see a lot more voices at the top. We can see these companies grow and thrive and capital can get deployed more effectively and imagine the change this could have on the world. And so at that point forward, it became almost a mandate for me. Like there wasn't a choice in building this company. It was, I kept going back to my experience with that first company and it was so painful and so difficult and so terrible. And I didn't want anybody else to experience that if they didn't have to. And and forever, that's kind of my, I think, North Star as I build Hello Alice. Yeah, I totally forgot about Circular Board and Circular Summit. And I, I came to one of the events. They're fantastic. And you had the online program. So that was kind of the, that was the segue into, yes. into the Alice idea. Yeah, and the company is the same. It really, I mean, we renamed the company, but the actual entity is the same entity. We took Circular Board and found certain things scaled really well from that model, certain things didn't. And so what could we create that was sort of the next iteration of that. Yeah. Okay. So tell us in a nutshell what Hello Alice is so everyone can go check it out. Great. Yeah. Hello Alice is a free technology that utilizes machine learning to make smart recommendations for the next step in your business journey. So it takes into account who you are as a business owner, the type of company that you want to grow, and the goal that you have at that moment in time. and makes recommendations on how-to guides that you should be going through networks that you should be joining, events you should be attending, opportunities that you should be taking a look at. And then within each step of the journey, it's asking you questions about the decisions you're making and why you're going in a certain path and what would be recommended so that you're continuously refining and the technology is learning more about you as a business owner and making smarter and smarter recommendations. Mm-hmm. What, what's your typical type? I mean, if, if there is one, who, who's your typical type of member who's in there? It's funny, right before this podcast, I was actually going through our monthly data report that our team shares. And I was commenting to Elizabeth, who was sitting right next to me, the diversity of the business owners is just astounding. I'm like, there is no typical. There's no typical. And I mean that from an industry breakdown, our top five industries were literally 12%, 12%, 12%, 11%, 11%. I mean, it's very split across industry. It's very split across... You know, I look at our top cities and they're, they're very much in line. I mean, it, it really is sort of a, there's no kind of dominant geography. There's no dominant industry. There's no overwhelmingly dominant. I mean, there, it's mostly women. We're about 64% female at this moment in time. We are mostly diverse women. So women of color. We have a really strong LGBT population. We have a really strong veteran population. We have entrepreneurs with disabilities. It's all walks of life. And that's 100% due to the partnerships that we formed. When we built Hello Alice, we didn't want it to be like a lot of the other technologies that support entrepreneurs, which in many of the cases we looked at were 90% plus white and male. 
which is astounding given that the fastest growing segments of entrepreneurs are women and women of color. So we form partnerships early on. We work with over 3,000 organizations across the country, everything from chambers of commerce to meetup groups to industry organizations. We really look for where are these diverse business owners today and how can we help support them and support the organizations that they're a part of through technology. You've attracted some amazing partners and companies backing what you're doing. Can, can you talk about how you attracted that or what, you know, how to even go about that? If someone's building something and sees what you've done, be like, wow, like that's kind of what I envision for my mission or, you know, what I'm creating and get, getting these big companies involved and organizations. What are some things that you did that worked that you could recommend? When Elizabeth and I started Hello Alice, we were both really clear that partnerships was the way to go. You know, we knew we were tackling a big problem and we knew as two people, there was absolutely no way we were even going to start to scratch the surface of, of what needed to be done to build a more equitable ecosystem. So she came from, you know, her time at the UN Foundation and her time at Dell as Michael Dell's entrepreneur in residence. Her job was totally about building those partnerships. And it's, it's why I saw such value in her as we started talking about the company I knew she had to come on board because she brought that to the table. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth really, that's the core of her focus is, is building those relationships and partnerships. My core job is executing, implementing those partnerships. Um, but partnership is at the core of everything we do. We started our very first bit of funding actually came from Dell. We were starting to build the technology. Elizabeth was still actually the entrepreneur in residence there. And this is before we should come on board, but they were looking for technology that would support women entrepreneurs at scale. And I happened to have this idea in my head. And that was really how the conversation started. And frankly, how Elizabeth and I got to know each other. And then ultimately, mm -hmm. she ended up coming on board. But that partnership with Dell turned into... It gave us credibility. I think it did two things for us. One, it gave us money, although all that money went straight into a lot of technology tools that in large part, frankly, went back to Dell's. It was sort of a win-win for them and for us. And then we use, yeah, we use those relationships to kind of get us to the next one and open the next door, open the next door. And now it's amazing. I mean, we, I still am shocked sometimes when I see the level of partners that get referred to us in our inboxes sometimes. I'm, I'm just, I sort of never lose that moment of a, being so grateful for Dell and everything they did for us in those early days. And they took that leap of faith on us when nobody knew what we were doing or who we are or what we could build. But then also all the partners along the way that have opened doors for us to others. We've always tried to over-deliver on partnerships and it's paid off in spades. Yeah. So it, it's really looking for the win-win in it as well, right? When you go to these organizations, it's, it's presenting that. Yeah, I think if, if I could give others advice, I think on, on specifically building partnerships, it's building the relationship before you need it and always respecting every relationship, regardless of whether they choose to work with you or not. And really thinking about it as the value of your, of your network. And we give all the time. I mean, there's not a week goes by where we're not sending flowers to someone or thank you notes or bottles of wine or something just to say, thanks for being a part of this journey. There are also oftentimes where we walk away from what could be very lucrative partnerships for us because there isn't an alignment with our mission. We've held diversity and, and inclusion. And again, building a really equitable small business ecosystem at the core of our business since day one. And we had investors tell us, you know, this isn't a payable market. This isn't a large enough market. You're in the wrong space. You should go be a nonprofit. We had corporations say, let us push you over to our foundation side. Like this isn't part of our marketing strategy. And we really held strong that if you don't believe this is a win-win for everybody, we're probably not the right company for you to work with. Yeah. And it's amazing now, so many of those corporations are coming full circle and saying, oh my gosh, we have to put our money where our mouth is. And the world is demanding to see evidence of, yeah. of what we're you doing. You were a little ahead of your time when you think about it. I mean, it was obviously needed and current a few years ago, but now you know, given current events and headlines and the demand that people have saying, we want to see companies doing this 
you know, we want to see companies helping diverse business owners get going and get growing. And so everything you've been doing, you know, is a little, I don't want to say ahead of its time, but like really that your time, if, if it wasn't there, the time has come now. Like what you're it's, doing is so Yeah, huge. what's amazing is, you know, Elizabeth and I knew, because we never looked at it as, as a charity or as a, a mission from a philanthropic standpoint, like we were going to go out and this was going to be our social good. We've always looked at it like a, a business opportunity. We knew if only 2% of women entrepreneurs are making over a million dollars, that's a problem. And it's not just a problem for women. It's a problem for our government. It's a problem for the corporations that are providing business services to them. It's a problem for our national economy. It's a problem in so many different ways. Certainly, it's a problem for the women. But we knew if those women succeeded, everybody was going to succeed. And so for us, it was, we're not doing this. I mean, certainly, we believe it's the right thing to do. But we also believe it's the smart thing to do. And I think that's the conversation for us always that we felt like people missed so much of the time. And now it seems like people are finally coming around to be like, this actually is a good business decision. And so when we talk to investors, like, you don't think this is a good business decision, don't invest in us. But we actually know this is a good business decision. Yeah. You, you were very clear on your values and what you stood for from the beginning of this. I'd love if you also talked about you were one of the first companies that we heard of and then got media attention at least around actions and morality clauses for board members, stockholders. And this is something that you really believe in and you've done some things like this yourself. Would you mind sharing? Yeah, when Elizabeth and I raised our seed capital, you know, our our first round of, of raising money came mostly from angel investors who believed in what we were building. And they again, took a total leap of faith. Women like Kathy Reed and Jean Case and Melinda Gates and, and people who heard about what we were doing and took a bet on us. And I'm forever grateful for all of those people because they, they got us through to the next stage. When we raised our Series A, it was much more about the business fundamentals. It's, you know, what are you building? How is this going to make us money? How are we going to get returns? We were going to traditional venture funds, Silicon Valley Bank, ended up leading that round of capital. And they were doing it, again, certainly because they think it's the right thing that the world needs it, but they were doing it because they thought it was a good business decision at the end of the day. And they had to answer to their investors and, and LPs. And so it became a lot about the business. We were, I will say for context at that point, Elizabeth and I had, you know, we were so low on capital and in cash. We had stopped taking a salary. We were days away from not being able to make payroll. And when that funding came in, I mean, it was a sigh of relief in a way that I, I can't even explain because it opened up the doors for us to really grow the company in the way that we knew we could. And it was a game changer for us. It gave us the breathing room to actually start to get strategic again versus just paying the bills every two weeks and hoping we can make payroll and having to make some decisions that weren't necessarily the best for the company, but would help make payroll. But once we got out of that mode, it put us on you know just a totally different trajectory. But back to the Me Too morality clause, in that raise, in spite of the fact that we needed that money so badly, I mean, it was was a lifeline for our business. We also knew if we were going to be an example of what the future of business needed to look like, we had to walk the walk. And so we, in the negotiations and all the things that were being negotiated, and while the reality is, you know, we didn't really have a leg to stand on at that time. We did put a clause in there that said any of our stockholders would use corporate governance to vote for the removal of any board member if there was a Me Too event, if there was racial discrimination, if there was sexual orientation discrimination, any sort of discrimination, they had to sign their voting rights before the event that they would oust that board member. And we put that in writing. We spent a lot of legal fees to get the writing in a way that everybody would, you know, agreed to it and that it was mm-hmm. clear and crisp and sound. And then also, you know, we were dealing with Silicon Valley Bank. They're a major banking institution, which as you can imagine is... Do you think they got this and they're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is like something that... We're, they're know, so lucky to be getting our money. Like, I can't believe they're putting this back on us because they're just not used to that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's something that, you know, it's not something that one person could just sign off on and say, okay, this really means, I mean, they're on our board. If something happens, it's a PR nightmare for them. It's a major deal. It's got some serious implications for them, which all the more reasons say what a what an outstanding institution that they signed the paperwork and stood by it. And not only stood by it, really lifted it up and elevated it and said, this should be the standard mm. for all future investment. Yeah. 
Yeah. I just thought that was wild. And I know you got some good media as a, as an added bonus, but you know, you, you really took a chance doing that. And that's when you're so clear in what you stand for, it makes these decisions easy and then naturally attracts the right partners. People don't want to go there though when you're scared, when you're broke, when you're not sure if the funding is going to come in. But look what that did now for not only you guys, but these institutions you're working with and then perhaps other companies that they'll be working with and supporting. Yeah, and I, I think it's a blend of we want to be partners and want to collaborate with the organizations we work with. And in every way we can, we will bend over backwards to make the experience a wonderful one for them. But when it comes to our values and when it comes to our mission, we don't budge. And that means making really hard decisions sometimes and really painful decisions and decisions that we know, I think, in our heart of hearts, it's going to be the best thing long-term for the business, but it's not always necessarily the best short-term decision. Mm -hmm. But when we created this company, and I think at the end of the day, when I put my head on the pillow at night, I want to know that we did what we felt was right and we stuck with our values. Yeah, I just love that. So everyone needs to go to helloalice.com. I was really impressed, by the way, with your COVID resources. It, it was such a mess during that time to find one place where you could get accurate <laughs> information. It sounds so crazy, but I sent all my members of the trust there. I sent a lot of my readers there. It was the most comprehensive, trustworthy place, I think, to go for all those resources for you know grants, PPP loans, all that stuff. And it just is a real testament to how much research you gals do and how much work you put into it. Talk a bit more about the resources inside the Hello Alice. And, and let's make this clear too. This is free to join, right? Totally free. Yes. Okay. We never charge anybody and free forever. We're not going to like Random throw money. some hidden charge in there in the future. It's always yeah. free. Okay, perfect. I know that you offer a lot of resources for small business owners to find, you know, particularly for maybe their situations, their types of businesses, who they are. There's all kinds of resources for grants, accelerator programs. Can you tell us more about that? Yes. We launched COVID-19 emergency grants weeks after Shelter-in-Place started. We launched the COVID-19 Business Center days after Shelter-in-Place started. And I have to give a shout out to our team here because they worked day and night to get that up quickly because we knew business owners were scrambling and we knew many of them had weeks, if not days, to keep their companies alive. And so while everybody was sorting through what the government funding looked like and what broader support looked like, we knew we had to get cash out fast. And so I'm super proud of what they were able to deliver in in such a short amount of time. We've continued to build on it. We work on it daily in terms of adding new resources to it, continuing to just follow the evolution of the ever-changing rules and regulations, and have split it out now into lots of different hubs. We have a Hispanic business center. We have an African-American business center, all of which you can link through COVID19businesscenter.com. We've worked with, again, our network of partners across the country to bring all the resources that they're offering. And so really trying to make it kind of a one-stop, really easily digestible resource to sort through. There's so much information out there and it's, like you said, it's changing all the time. So that was our goals. Let's business owners have enough to deal with. Let's give them one less thing to have to worry about and help them sort through this. Mm -hmm. And then inside Alice, so there's a lot of resources similar, not just for COVID, right? Yes. Yeah. Our goal is helping business owners walk through the day-to-day decisions that they're making. We, you know, we're not as much about kind of the inspirational stories and the advice. It's really the tactical in the weeds. How do I get these things done? How do I hire my first employee? And what does that look like if I live in the state of Iowa? You know, how do I go out and have a pitch competition? How do I make my voice heard in a conversation? How do I negotiate a contract? It's really kind of in the weeds of lots of these decisions. And so that's the type of content that you'll find there. So I I always tell every business owner, if you're struggling for the how and the step-by-step and we don't use fancy terms. We don't make things complicated. We break it down into here's step one, here's step two. We might ask a question in the middle to say, hey, like, are you, these are the two directions you could go. Here's a rationale for each. Pick your direction and go. So it's very dynamic and very personalized to the business owner. Yeah. It's come such a long way too. I mean, because I've been checking in since its initiation and just so impressed with all the resources in there. It's something everyone should check out. 
Well, thank you. And, and we know there's, you know, there is no catch all for everything. We can create content all day long, every day. And so we have a business owner community of over, gosh, I mean, we've got over 200,000 business owners we support where you can ask questions and there's experts in there. And Ali, you have to jump in too and answer questions for people because you have so much great advice to share. So there's always, I think anytime there's any question for your business, it's a great place to post it and there's experts on everything to help you through it. Okay, great. So Carolyn, to wrap up, can you share three great pieces of advice that you have uh, learned over your career that you, you know, all the women listening and they're all levels of business, you know, our audience listening to the show, is it all different types of levels? They're all over the world, but what are three pieces of advice they could all relate to? The first is leverage your network today. Don't wait for things to be perfect. Don't wait for a moment in time. Just act today. Make that phone call today to somebody that you think can help your business. And I think it's one thing that all of you should be doing, hopefully, as you're listening to this. Just write down the name of that person and pick up the phone and call them. The second is spend 80% of your time on revenue generating activities. If it's not helping to bring in business, it's not really pushing your business forward. There's a lot of things we have to do. There's a lot of administrative stuff. There's a lot of different pieces of running a business and it's easy to get caught up in those. Make sure every day you're spending 80% of your time on something that's pushing your revenues forward. And that might be hiring the right employee. It might be making that phone call to that customer. It might be that Instagram post, but it has to be pushing you towards generating revenue. And then the third is get the best talent you can. I always know this was advice I struggled with early on because I was like, well, I don't have money. And so it's really great to say, go hire great people, but I don't have any money. And so I think before you have the money, build your circle, get people excited. Your job as CEO or founder or president or whatever your title is, your job as the owner of this business is to get people excited about what you're building and to build momentum behind it. So go to your friends, go to your network, go to your colleagues, go to you know customers Get them so excited about the bigger picture of what you're creating that they want to be a part of it and they want to bring resources to the table. Keep them in your orbit, work together, get them involved in the process and start thinking about as you build that business, bringing people into the fold and getting the very best talent behind you that's passionate about what you're building, that knows what you're building, that believes in what you're building because good people make a huge difference. Mm, Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Carolyn. It's great to catch up with you. Likewise. I'm always glad to hear about the amazing things you're up to. Hopefully see you soon in person. That would be a dream. (laughs) Sounds good. Come get the kids in camp. (laughs) Take care. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Glambition Radio. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe so you automatically get new shows every week. And I'd love if you left us a review. We are on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and other platforms. And I'd love to hear from you. Come join the conversation online. You'll mostly find me on Instagram, but also on Facebook, Twitter, and more. Just head to AllieBrown.com. You will find them all there. And you can also learn about upcoming opportunities to meet in person. Glambition Radio is the elevated conversation for women leaders, and I'm honored you've tuned in.